All right, good morning. This is good. Y'all are getting this one early and get it over with. So my name is Jacob Reed. I'm with BASF. I uh, manage the research side out on the East Loop. And fun topic today, drift minimization. So let's go ahead and get started. So what I want to do first is I just want to start with some updates. These are just news updates. If there's news pertaining to drift, I tried to look this up and figure out what's going on. And there's actually quite a bit of news, and I pared it down to some, I, I would say, important news articles that I see coming through. Here's the first one. Sorry the, the print is small, but probably the big one is that Enlist herbicides did get re-registered. And that's pretty big news. Uh, the industry really was watching whether or not Enlist would be able to be re-registered. And if it did, that meant good things for dicamba as well. So really what happened was it was re-registered, but there were a few small label changes. And I know you can't read these, but a lot of the label changes have to do with runoff. Now, I don't know if we're going to face a lot of issues with runoff in our area, but those are some label changes probably coming down the pipe on a number of our products. And so just to, just to keep you in check there, that's, that's something we're going to see on labels, I would guess. Uh, again, probably doesn't affect us too much. Here is the new Enlist Duo label, and some of the things that this label is saying is that if there's a risk of rainfall within 48 hours of the application, you can't spray, or you can't run a pivot or overhead irrigation 48 hours after you spray. And again, this all has to do with runoff. I know it's not drift, but it kind of is drift. It's the idea of getting a product where you don't want it. Um, and there's some endangered species talk, too. Uh, that's we're going to talk about that later in the talk today, but the Endangered Species Act is going to have a big impact on how our labels look in the future, and that has directly to do with drift. Uh, just in case you're curious, and I think, uh, I think Caitlin showed this on another slide, but there are some counties in Texas where Enlist and Enlist Duo cannot be applied. That won't affect us up here too much. Now, one of the interesting things that's happening is that you know, EPA used to be the big baddie on the block, and nobody liked to even say EPA. It was kind of a kind of a word like you would rate movies with. Things have changed a little bit, though, and I don't want to say they're not a baddie anymore. I mean, they're they're doing some good work, and they're actually starting to work with grower groups and listen to grower groups. And these grower groups are saying what all of us in the room would say to EPA, and they're representing us well. And EPA is listening, and so what they're doing as EPA listens, is they're starting to actually do some of what we want them to do in these labels so that we can continue to use these products. And here's how this came about. It's really interesting. So again, EPA was kind of the big baddie. There were other environmental groups, pretty radical ones, that were suing EPA. And as they sued EPA, EPA said, well, let's make changes. Growers, grower groups then say, no, 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 you can't do that. You can't just get rid of these products. We, we depend on them. And now EPA is stuck in the middle between lawsuits going back and forth. What did EPA decide to do in most of these? They decided to take a good middle road and listen to people. So I don't, I don't want to put them, you know, I don't, I don't want to paint a picture that's not true, but I do want to say there's some good things going on where we're being listened to, and I think we're going to see some good products labeled and re-registered, maybe with some mitigation measures, and that's what we're starting to see. If you're curious real quick about how the Endangered Species Act is going to affect our labels and drift language and things like that, this is a really good article. And this over here on the right is actually a code. You can scan this, and it links to that article. And this is off DTN. And this lady here really wrote a great article on what Endangered Species Act means for us as producers. And uh, interestingly, when it comes to labels, when it comes to drift mitigation and all that, if you want to blame something and blame the Endangered Species Act, that's going to have a big impact in a lot of future decisions. I'll give you a little bit of second, a few seconds here to copy that if you want to. And I've got this. I can pull it up on a computer later if you want to scan that. Okay, so let's just talk about some news. So you may or may not have heard there was a peach grower down in Georgia, and at Bader Farms was the name of the farm. They sued because of dicamba drift on their peach orchard. And they won. And this was a pretty big case. The industry was looking at this to see if a lot of these cases would actually make it through the courts. This one did. And uh, the court sided with the peach farmer and said, yep, uh, get after it. There were putative damages of something like $60 million plus damages to the orchard that companies were required to pay. 
That went to an appeals court, and the appeals court said, yes, that's exactly what you're going to have to do is, is pay up on this. This was pretty big for the industry because a lot of industry people said, all right, what do we need to do now about these products that we've already got out on the market and our growers going to be able to continue to use them? Here is the, uh, here's just a little write-up from it. Uh, Bader argued successfully that dicamba drift caused devastation to his 1,000-acre peach orchard. And in this court ruling, it was blamed specifically on drift, that even all the right products were applied, it was that they weren't applied in the correct way. Therefore, Bader Farms wins the lawsuit. No, oh, but wait, no, we've got to go back. Court's going to reverse this. They reversed the putative damages. So my point in showing this slide is this is pretty recent. This was from August. And actually, Tiffany, who should speak later, may even talk about this. But these court battles, they go back and forth. And uh, it's, a, it's a lot of money. It's a lot of lawyers making money. And it's a real lot of confusion for us knowing what these products are going to be useful for in the future. But that's the, that's the update on this uh, peach case in Georgia. A little closer to home, the, uh, the dicamba lawsuit on the vineyards down in Terry, Gaines County, in that area. This is an interesting story. This, this court case originally was going to, all of it was going to have to take place down around Beaumont where the dicamba plant is. And they, since everything was filed and that's where dicamba was made, they were going to have that court, all, all of that take place down there. Recently, a court granted a motion for those trials to take place up here. So I don't know if that'll be Lubbock or Terry County, but it will be somewhere up here that all of those proceedings will take place. The Beaumont Court of Appeals reversed and ordered the case be transferred to the counties wherein the plaintiff's vineyards are located. So just some news there. And again, this all has to do with drift. Uh, this is a little bit hard to see, but this is a map of California. So interesting things going on in California. They are now required, if you make any sort of pesticide application in the state of California, you have to submit that to a database and you have to say what you're spraying and how much you're spraying. All that gets thrown into a database. And what they can do now is they can map where products are going down and how much is going down. Okay, sounds pretty nice. Well, that's gotten pretty granular. They've got a number of, of sites now, and, and I'll say this. Used to, they kind of mapped that on a county-by-county county basis. Now they map that on a farm-by-farm farm basis. So this map here shows how much pesticide has been applied per farm in California. And then what they're doing now is they're taking population data and they're matching that up with pesticide use data. And then people are writing articles like this. Pesticide use and potential risks to people living or working in Ventura County, California. So you can see here this map on the right, the red, the orange, the yellow, that indicates farms and what pesticide have been applied to those farms and how much. And then these little purple splotches, that's schools. So you see where this is going, right? Now they're starting to say, well, because of the pesticide use, now we've probably got these health problems that they can also map because that's all in databases as well. Communities of color at greatest risk of pesticide exposure in Ventura County, California. They're doing this now where they're matching it to population data. I won't let this slide stand for long, but the data show greater pesticide application in communities with a higher percentage of people who identify as Latino, Black, and Asian American. The areas in the county where very little or no pesticides are applied are largely inhabited by non-Hispanic white residents. This guy, I don't know who this is, or gal, I'm not sure. This is another stark example of unjust policies and practices rooted in environmental racism. Okay, now, I'm not making any political points here. If they want to collect data, fine. What I'm saying is that drift is a very important issue for us. It's very important because people now are starting to take data on where products are applied and how much. Our job as growers is to make sure that when we put down a product, it's, it's put right where we want it to go and it doesn't end up somewhere else. That's the whole point of this talk and the reason why is because people are starting to take data on this and it's pretty, it's getting down to the farm level. So hopefully they won't do this in Texas, but in California it's happening real life. 
Uh, this is an article, Residential Proximity to Pesticide Application as a Risk Factor for Childhood Central Nervous System Tumors. So now you see the link. Something was applied on this farm. There's a school nearby. We can link that to health data. And you know how it goes. It doesn't have to, it doesn't have to actually be scientific. It's just, well, there's, there's correlation here. Therefore, it must be the cause. Okay, that's what, that's what we're getting into. Again, our job as growers is to say, no, that can't be the cause because when we put down this product, there's no way it moved off site. It stayed where it was supposed to. We've got the data to prove it. Weather data, application data, we've got it right here in our records. I did a Google search on residential proximity pesticide. I just typed that in and there were 3,000 results returned. So a lot of people are doing studies on this, a lot of people. And again, it's our job to make sure that when we make an application, it stays where we put it, and we've got the records to show that. Uh, some other news, this isn't quite as scary, but maybe so. Uh, again, EPA is trying to toe a line here. This has to do with the Endangered Species Act, and this really is about runoff again. But uh, I don't know if you've seen articles on this, but they're talking about limiting atrazine applications because of runoff and limiting that where especially it could run off into major streams. So I won't get into this much. It's just some interesting news. If you want to look at it online, just type in atrazine endangered species act. And there's a lot of, there's a lot of articles explaining what's going on there. Again, one of the things EPA is doing and I'm, I'm happy about this is instead of just saying no more atrazine, EPA has listened to growers they're listening to grower groups, and what they're saying is, okay, instead of just not labeling atrazine, we're going to label it, but we're going to give you a pick list of options of ways that you can mitigate runoff. And like Chris Verrett talked about this morning, cover crops is on a lot of these. So I don't know how many, how many products we're going to see these kind of pick lists on, but to me that's an encouraging step that EPA has given us some options of things we're already doing to mitigate drift and runoff and things like that. I hope that keeps up. All right, so that's some news. That's the scary stuff. We won't get into any more scary things until I get to the snakes part of this talk. But let's get some regulations update. What has changed in terms of drift regulations in 2022? And I am happy to say that really nothing. The label language that you'll see is going to look very similar to the way it did in 2021 and 2022. I don't know of really any major changes that don't talk about nozzles, wind, boom height and buffer zones. All that's going to look pretty much the same. The big difference is that the Endangered Species Act, we're starting to see some fallout from that. So more to come on that maybe in 24. So let's talk about avoiding spray drift. Now, if you've seen me talk before, you know that I hate snakes. I mean, I really hate them. I would almost rather get stabbed in the leg than see a snake. Uh, they're not my friends and I don't like them. These are some little buddies that were in my drip box, and when I opened that thing up, I did jump back and scream. This mama right here, I walked around the corner from my pickup getting a screwdriver or something. I was working on a pivot, and there she was. She was at least five feet long, but she looked eight in my mind. And I, like I said, I don't like snakes. Why do I bring up snakes? Uh, it's because they were where they, I don't want them. They were in a place that I didn't want them to be. And when we're talking about drift, that's what we're talking about, is something in a place where somebody else doesn't want it to be. Well, like good snakes do, they multiplied. And now I've got more snakes on my place. And really, I don't know what to do about them except just shoot them. But this one was in a prairie dog hole. I wish they would eat the prairie dogs. They're not doing a very good job of that. But anyway, that's the whole point about snakes and drift is that when we talk about drift, and if, especially if you look in the court language, the court language doesn't say stuff like drift is just a nuisance. And if you look on court documents, they're saying that drift is equal to trespassing or negligence. Now, all of us in this room, we don't like people trespassing on our ground. None of us do. Well, in the drift world, when you see these court documents, Bader Farms, others that are suing, they are saying a drift complaint is not just it's a nuisance to me. They are saying it's a trespass. They are criminally trespassing on my land and destroying something of value. And so I just want to bring that language to the table here. We don't have to agree with it, but the courts are agreeing with it, that they're saying when we talk about drift, they're talking just about 
criminal trespass or criminal negligence. So we've got to start thinking of it in that term, or otherwise we're fighting the court system. And you know the song, I fought the law, and the law won. All right, so four keys to minimizing drift. They're the same as we've talked about in years past. Nozzles, wind speed, boom height, and then sensitive crops. So when it comes to reducing drift, the single most important decision you can make as a producer is your nozzle. And it, it, there's just no way around it. Nozzles make a huge difference in how much product ends up where you want it to go and how much ends up in the air. They make a huge difference. Uh, we've talked about this in years past. When we, when we talk about what comes out of a nozzle, it's not just one droplet size. There's actually kind of a spectrum of sizes. And they measure each little droplet in microns. And you can see here there's, a, there's different sizes that kind of matter. A human hair is about 100 microns in width. I don't think mine are that wide anymore. But that 100 microns, 150 microns is an important size because anything under that is what you call a driftable fine. A driftable fine, you can think of it kind of like fog or a mist. A driftable, a driftable fine is a particle that's small enough that when it comes out of that nozzle, it's probably not going to hit the ground for a while. And any air movement, whether that's your sprayer moving through the field or wind, can carry that driftable fine until it lands. And some of these things can drift for half a mile. They'll go a long way depending on the wind. A staple's about 500 microns in diameter, and a paper clip's about 850. I put those on there because droplet sizes that we want coming out of that nozzle need to be in that range, somewhere 500 to 850, if we don't want it to drift onto a neighbor. And again, like we talked about, uh, nozzles produce a spectrum of droplet sizes. So when you blow something out of a nozzle, you're going to get some of those droplets that are very small, some of them that are large, and then most of them kind of hit in a midpoint. So when we talk about wanting to reduce drift, what we're talking about is moving that, that point over, that midpoint there in the middle. And what we're doing is we're taking the number of driftable fines that come out of that nozzle and just reducing it. So you can see here on the examples, this top nozzle, most everything's about 300 microns in diameter, but I got a lot of driftable fines coming out. If I change nozzles, then I've moved my midpoint, and now I'm producing larger droplets, but I've also reduced the number of driftable fines. Plain and simple. There's a standard. It's uh, American Society of Agricultural and Biological Engineers standard talking about nozzles and what droplet size they produce, and they color code these. When we talk about reducing drift, we're talking about needing a nozzle that is coarse to ultra coarse. And all that means is that the droplets coming out of it are larger. Okay, so just some examples here. This is a neat little chart. Three very familiar nozzles that we know about. This extended range flat fan, an AIXR, and a turbo T induction. We'll talk about those here in a little bit. But here's the point. On this flat fan nozzle, our driftable fines, are, we've got quite a bit. In fact, they estimate 35% of the volume coming out of the, one of those nozzles is a driftable fine. So think about that. If you're spraying out 1,000 gallons... 350 gallons can float around in the air freely, very freely. That's a lot of volume in the air. Just by changing the nozzle to an AIXR, we can reduce that down to 7%. By the way, I use AIXRs on most of my operations, unless I'm doing a dicamba or 240 application. Those AIXRs are really nice nozzles, and there's other ones that are similar. They just produce a really good pattern. I like it. When we change nozzles again to that TTI, we can get the number of driftable fines down below 1% of the volume. Now that's pretty impressive that we can do that just by changing that little piece of plastic or metal on our sprayer. So there are three main types of low drift nozzles that are out on the market today. We'll go through some of them just so you can see them. By the way, as I go through these, if you're a manufacturer or if you know I've missed a really good nozzle, let me know. I can certainly include that in. This is just what I could find by calling around and, and getting on the internet. But the three main types of low drift nozzles that are out on the market are a pre-orifice, an air induction, or a combination of the two. And a pre-orifice is, okay, a, a nozzle is basically just a piece of plastic or metal with, metal with a hole in it. Pre-orifice just has another hole before that main hole. And what it does is by sending all of that volume through that first hole, 
it usually creates some kind of turbulence within that nozzle that recombines small particles. And then all that can exit, and you get larger droplets coming out. An air induction nozzle simply brings air into that system, and that causes recombination, which then makes it where larger droplets come out. And then combos use a combination of the two. So let's just run through some here. Uh, this is John Deere's Ultra Low Drift, and it's a, it's a pretty basic nozzle. It's just a pre-orifice nozzle. And you'll notice as I go through these, a lot of these are either engineered for or can be used with pulse width modulation systems. They do make nozzles that they don't recommend for PWM systems, but on these, some of these are actually engineered for it. So I'll have that on there and you can see which ones are what. Greenleaf also makes some nozzles. These are called a blended pulse and dual fan nozzle. Uh, the blended pulse is a pre-orifice and it's, it really is made for PWM systems. That's what they make it for. That soft drop, is more of just a regular sprayer nozzle, but it also is a low drift type of nozzle. By the way, I think all of these, don't quote me, but I think all of these can be used with oxen herbicides. And so if you're wondering if you can use one with your dicamba applications, uh, you might key on these and make sure that they're on those labels. T-Jet Technology is probably the leader in a lot of ways in nozzle technology. Uh, their, their main nozzle that they really advertise is this Turbo T induction. That's the one we mentioned earlier. And it's a combo nozzle. It brings in air, but it's also got a turbulence chamber inside there and a pre-orifice. Uh, these also, you can, you can get them as a single exit or a, or a twin fan exit on those, on those nozzles, and they're pretty neat. Now, they've just come out with an AccuPulse nozzle. I've never used this one before. I don't know what it's like. Uh, has anybody in here used that, that AccuPulse nozzle? Okay, I think it's pretty new on the market. Um, it's a, it's a pre-orifice turbulence chamber nozzle, so it's kind of a combo of two different technologies. This one, they say, is actually engineered for pulse width modulation systems. So they, they engineered it specifically for those. It's got a twin spray pattern, and apparently they've, they've actually patented the exit orifice. Um, they say it's got some kind of concave exit geometry that's supposed to really help it. Again, I don't, I don't know much about that, but if you want to look at it online, there's some pretty neat videos about it. Pentair or Hypro makes a couple of nozzles as well. Their latest is this Ultra Low Drift Max. It's a pre-orifice nozzle. One of the selling points on it is that it's got a 130 degree spray angle, so that's pretty wide. And what that means is you can probably drop your boom just a little bit as well. So if you're, if you're worried about spraying too high, that wider spray angle probably allows you to get a little bit lower. It's got, I don't know what this is, a duckbill exit orifice. Maybe it quacks, I'm not sure. But it can be used with PWM systems. And then their ULD nozzles, these are pretty old ones by now. They're a combo type nozzle. Uh, they air induction and uh, they've also got kind of a turbulence chamber pre-orifice in there as well. Uh, pretty good nozzle. I've used these in the past. The neat thing about those, too, is I think they come with a filter already in there, so you don't have to have that separate. Wilger, they've got a whole line of different types of nozzles, and their two that are low drift are called their UR series and DR series. And these are combo, no well, the, the UR series is a combo nozzle. The DR series is a pre-orifice nozzle. And one thing they advertise is that only, or is that less than 2% of the volume I misspelled that, whoops. Less than 2% of the volume of these DR series is, is less than 141 microns. So pretty good nozzles. That's nozzles. And again, those, you just remember those three types, those air inductions or the pre-orifice or some combo type. That's, that's what you're going to see on the market. I'll talk about just a couple of new technologies. And these things can help us with drift in different ways. Uh, the first one is just simply these nozzle selectors. I think I've had this up before where you know how it is, you're going out and you're spraying for aphids on one spray, then you need to spray some Liberty on another one, and then you need to come back and spray dicamba on another field. Like, you can't switch a 90-foot boom, all those nozzles, but you can if you've got these types of systems where you can just go through and select. It just speed things up, gives you opportunities to use different nozzles. Those things are expensive, I know, but it is one way if you're working on uh, trying to minimize drift, that can help. PWM systems can also help, and John Deere's got their exact apply. There's, of course, the Case Aim Command and then Raven's Hawkeye. They actually say these do help with drift a little bit, and I think it's because you're keeping a constant pressure over the entire width of that field. 
Uh, because of that, you're really reducing the amount of driftable fines that end up in the air. This is pretty new. I think this came out last season, but this is the John Deere Sea and Spray Ultimate. And this is, a, uh, this is one of those technologies where they run cameras on the boom, and as it runs through, it detects weeds and then turns on and off boom sections to spray those weeds if needed. Now, what this really does, you're not reducing drift by reducing the amount of, of, of driftable fines that come out. You're reducing drift by reducing the amount that you're spraying. Does that make sense? You're actually spraying fewer acres, which reduces the amount of drifts in the air. Um, pretty neat. This is all factory installed. You basically got, got to buy a new sprayer to get one of these. But it's a pretty neat system if you can afford it. They got a camera there. It detects weeds and it sprays sections of the boom depending on if there's weeds there. There's actually dual tanks on the sprayer. And what that does is it allows you to put down a broadcast application like a soil applied constantly. And then other sections come on when you need an over the top for your weeds. I've not used one of these. I've not seen one. I've only heard about them. And uh, there's a Western Equipment booth right back there if you want to know more about it. This is something that I saw a news article on this year, but I've not seen anything else. And what this is, is it, the, the article just said Bayer was awarded for their drift radar system. Now, the way this system works is that you load in information into your onboard computer, and it knows what's around you. So it knows if there's sensitive crops, it knows if you've got a tree row, and it also knows if you're supposed to leave some kind of a, a non-spray buffer in your field. So that instead of you going through the field and figuring, oh, I guess I'm 350 feet away, I'll turn the boom off, it does all that automatically. And it turns on and off sections of your boom as you drive through. That to me is a pretty neat technology. It also takes wind speed as you're driving through so that if the wind is blowing toward a sensitive crop, it'll shut off a boom at the right spot. Again, I don't know much about this. I saw one news article on it, but if Bayer's working on this, it's a pretty neat technology. Keep your eye open. One other thing that I've seen is these, uh, is these reclamation systems, and I don't know if any of you have these on board. John Deere's got one. I think it's just called the pressure recirculation reclaim upgrade. Uh, Precision Planting's product is called Reclaim, and then Raven has one called Boom Recirculation. Now what this does, you know how when you, you load up your tank and then you put your product in, you've got to prime that boom somehow. You've got to get to the end of the turn row and turn everything on and let it sit there for a minute before you get all that product down to the end of the boom. What this product does is instead of you having to do that, is it recirculates your product through the boom before you ever get into the field. That way when you turn your switch on, the first spray out, you're ready to go. So. What they did here, just to show this, this sprayer on the left has the reclaim or some kind of reclamation system on it. The sprayer on the right does not. They basically turn these booms on at the same time. And you can see they've got a blue dye in there that they put in the tank. This guy's already ready to spray. This guy here is going to have to wait a little bit. What this has to do with drift is that if you've got a spot where you really don't want to be spraying out on the turn row for a minute because of some drift issues, one of these systems lets you just automatically go, and you're just throwing less driftable fines into the air on the turn row. Another technology that is out there are these DRAs. In fact, I think Caitlin talked about that in her talk. Question is, can I use a drift reduction agent to minimize drift? The answer is yes, but it's not as impactful as the nozzle. There's a gob of these things out there. We're not going to go through them. This quick graph, I think, shows the story. This is an AIXR nozzle on the left, and this is a TTI on the right. The green bar is without a DRA, and you can see with the AIXR, I mean, just by switching nozzles, we took it down 7%, down to almost that 1% driftable fines. The DRA didn't take it down that much. We've still got 7.2% driftable fines with the DRA and the AIXR. We really have to switch nozzles and put in the DRA in order to reduce drift. So DRAs are helpful. They're required on a label for those auxins, but the nozzle is what makes the difference. Okay, let's talk quickly about wind speed. This one's pretty obvious. In fact, we probably already know the answer to this. Wind speed for most herbicide application needs to be 3 to 10 miles an hour, just like it always blows around here. That's not a good situation to be spraying. 
And the neat thing about living around here is I got lots of pictures about not good conditions to spray in. There's another one. I mean, I could go on and on, but I won't. A um, couple little quick updates. Um, this slide here just shows some products and then the labeled wind speed. And you see most of these are within that 3 to 10. Two of them that have changed recently is Cotteran and Liberty. I don't remember what they were before. I think they were either 0 or 2, but they have raised that to 3 miles an hour on both. The only one left with a 0 is Reflex. But everything else labeled wind speed is 3 to 10 for the most part. How do you measure wind speed? My favorite way is just to grab one of these, and there's a lot of different options for a little handheld. I keep these in the tractor, and when I need to measure wind speed on the fly, I stick it out the door, and there we go. Um, you can see here that inflation is real. It's even impacting the cost of a handheld wind meter. But there's a lot of these out there, and some of them are cheap, some of them aren't. They make some really cool ones. This Kestrel group makes a really cool ballistic one. So if you do any shooting, they make a really nice one that'll do crosswind calculations and all that too. So you can go as fancy as you want. You can also do this with basically a portable weather station. Um, some of you may have these at your house, and that's a, that's a valid method of measuring wind speed. TDA doesn't care how you measured it as long as you've been accurate about it. You can put these on your pivot. You can put these on your drip. I mean, you can, you can really spend some money if you want to. It's whatever you want to do. There's different ways to do it. West Texas Mesonet is a great way, too. I, I don't have a Mesonet station close to my location, but if you do, that's another valid way to measure wind speed. The cool thing about them is they've got a really nice app. And you can save several locations. By the way, on the Mesonet, the Android app is no longer working. So if you've got an iPhone, you're in good shape on the Mesonet website, but for some reason, Android's out. I hope they, hope they get that updated soon. That there is the Mesonet station around Floyd Ada, so pretty close to around here. Again, you can, you can get online. You can do this on the web and just see kind of, kind of a triangulation thing. How's the wind at my neighbor's place? How's the wind over there in Silverton? What does it look like? Is something blowing in? Sometimes you can see fronts blowing through on the Mesonet. That's pretty nice. Just a good way to gauge wind speed. Uh, there's a depressing slide with rainfall for last year. We'll go past that quick. Uh, this is the Roundup Ready Extend Spray app. As far as I know, this is still working. And one of the neat things about it is you can actually put your farms in there, and it'll do some forecasting for you. So you can say, you know, I want to put down an application today. It's 8 a.m. What's the wind going to be like at 1? And it'll tell you that. It's pretty nice. BASF also has a website, the Ingenious Spray Tool. Same type of deal. It'll do some forecasting for you and just allow you to kind of make some decisions on the fly if you need. John Deere also has a mobile weather station that you can put on your tractor or sprayer. I haven't seen these. I haven't used them. I just know about them. And again, ask these guys with Western back here if you have some questions about that. Trimble also makes one. It's a, they call it the Trimble Field IQ ISO bus. I don't know what all that stands for, but it'll, it'll pipe into your Trimble system or maybe some other systems as well. And it's a good way just to record instant weather data as you're spraying if you need that information. The point of all this really is to remember that when we fill out our sprayer applicator records, we are required to put down wind direction, wind velocity, and air temperature. So whatever method you use, just remember that stuff has to be recorded. And I go back to what I said earlier with this data collection. If groups start coming in and they start collecting, you know, farm level data on what we're applying, when, and all of that, if we've got records to show that, you know what, the wind was blowing in the right direction, it was underneath the, you know, the 10 mile an hour threshold, I was applying the product according to the label, they don't have a lot to come at us with. If we're taking good, accurate data and truthful and honest data, then I think that saves us in a lot of ways and saves us to be able to continue to use these products. That's it on wind speed. It's common sense, right? Um, make sure the wind's not blowing like crazy, like it is with that guy down there. Let me mention real quick temperature inversions. Uh, there's been some confusion about what a temperature inversion is, but the bottom line is that in a normal situation, there is cooler air up high, and warmer air down low. As the sun heats up at the surface of the earth, there's warm air down here. So when you make an application, if you get any movement of a product, it's supposed to go up. 
During a temperature inversion, though, the problem we get is that we get warm air high and cool air low. And what that causes is that causes a product, instead of moving vertical, to move horizontal. And you can see it here in these two pictures. That top picture is a smoke bomb released in a normal type of situation, and you can see that smoke is going up. In a not normal situation, we've got a temperature inversion, that smoke starts moving sideways. Now think about that when you're spraying any of your fields. If you have product moving sideways and you've got an orchard or a vineyard or tomatoes next door to you, uh, that's just a bad situation. I took this picture one morning after I went to work and was checking on the field. Um, my office is over here and I drove down a dirt road and then turned the corner. And you can see that dust just sat there. And you've, you've all seen this happen. That's a temperature inversion where nothing wants to move vertical. It's all just kind of sitting. The wind's calm, but it's going to move horizontally. And uh, I'm glad that wasn't Dicamba or 2,4-D. Boom height, again, this is pretty common sense. I, th I, th I think this is common sense, but I also think that sometimes we, we look back there. I've done this a thousand times. You look back and you say, yeah, I'm about 24 inches above the target. And in reality, we're more like six feet above the target. Or we think, I want to get good coverage. I'm going to raise that boom as high as we can go. There's actually reasons, though, to keep these booms at the right height. And it all has to do with the way these nozzles are. When you, when you put your boom together, they actually angle these nozzles in a certain way so that you get overlap. And then nozzles are manufactured to be able to overlap in a certain way so that you get full coverage of your product as you go through the field. The goal is 24 inches above the target. <clears throat> so these two guys, these, these guys are kind of funny. I, I, there were some videos online of them. The guy on the right's name is Tom Wolf, And Tom Wolf has done nozzle and drift and anything to have to do with sprayers education for years. He's a Canadian guy, I think. Yeah, I'm pretty sure he's a Canadian guy, so he's got a, he's got a fun accent. But the neat thing about some of the stuff he does is he's an engineer at heart, too. So he understands how these things work. And he really gets how nozzles work. So him and this other dude, I don't know this guy's name, uh, they did a pretty neat video where they were talking about coverage of nozzles and coverage of a spray area. And they did it in snow. I don't know why they did it in snow, but they did. This guy's out there spraying with a backpack sprayer in snow. And when he raised his boom too high, you can see here, he's just drifting all over the place for one. But see, he gets this real uneven coverage. So you can imagine if you've got a product that you need good coverage on and that boom's too high, this is a potential, especially in a wind. When that boom is too low, you get these streaks. And I've seen fields, especially of wheat, where that's the case, trying to terminate wheat and a boom is too low. And you do, you literally get these streaks going through the field. There's, a, there's an optimum height that these nozzles operate at. It's supposed to be about 24 inches above the target. And so you can see this guy down here. He's up pretty high. He's probably up five and a half feet or something like that. And, I mean, stuff's just going everywhere. Uh, if he's spraying for aphids, man, bless him. He's probably getting great coverage. But if he's trying to put herbicide down and, and, and kill something with a contact, I mean, it's, that's a tough situation. Um, not the one to be in. That's just too high. That is really more ideal, and I know it doesn't look right. Every time I get in a tractor and I measure it and I drop down, I'm like, man, that does not look right. But when I look at the spray pattern, I move it across some concrete or something, I'm like, yeah, that's, that's perfect coverage. So it, the mind is tricky, but that is the optimum height for these nozzles is about 24 inches. And the biggest thing, too, is besides getting good coverage, is this greatly reduces drift. You're only giving those driftable fines you know, two feet before they have to hit the ground instead of five where they can drift through the air. All right, buffer zones, I'm not going to get into this much. The basic label language behind buffer zones is that if you're next to a sensitive crop or something like that, you're supposed to not spray a certain distance from it. Mostly going to go through some news here, and uh, you can look on labels to figure these things out. But a lot of the, a lot of the label language with, with these buffer zones right now has to do with runoff. So what they're saying is if you're close to a stream or a lake, you have to be so many feet away from that spraying. You can't get close to it. Um, lots of Endangered Species Act talk, or the Endangered Species Act talk here. And this has to do with a FIFRA interim ecological mitigation process. Uh, lots of language just to say that um, they're trying to reduce spray drift next to anything that's sensitive 
and they're considering waterways and water passages sensitive, so that means we can't spray close to them. Doesn't affect us a whole lot unless you're near some water. <clears throat> Paraquat, though, uh, Paraquat's an interesting story. We use that almost every season, and there has been some new label language in the Paraquat label around residential areas that has to do with buffer zones. Those are right here in the middle, and there are now required residential buffers when we spray Paraquat. And these are, I don't know where they came up with this value, but if you're spraying less than 1.6 pints per anchor, you have to have a 50-foot buffer, buffer. And if you're over 1.6 pints, a 75%, sorry, 75-foot buffer. Again, I don't know where they came up with those numbers, but when we start talking about buffer zones and drift, this, you're going to see this on the Paraquat label from here on out. Okay, let's update real quick on endangered species. Um, I said that the Endangered Species Act is going to affect label language in a big way. And I don't know what all that is in the future, but we need to keep an eye on it. There has been one new species that's been added to the endangered species list that we have in this area. And that's the lesser prairie chicken. I don't know if you knew that, but he's, they, they've been added. Uh, lesser prairie chicken has been added to the endangered species list. One of the interesting things is that they've divided their habitat into two zones. There's a northern zone and a southern zone. So here we are in Floyd County, and that zone runs almost right through here. That northern zone is really up in Kansas, Oklahoma, Texas. I'm from right there, by the way, and we've got a lot of those little birds in that area. And then there's this southern zone where we may not be affected by it too much, but uh, we, we may be. I don't know. The point of all this is is that with the Endangered Species Act, there's a, there's a lot more label language around spraying around endangered species. And there's an EPA website that I think for some applications you have to consult now. You're required to, and you have to, you have to record when you did. But it's called uh, Bulletins Live. I don't know why they named it that. It wasn't a great name. But this Bulletins Live, you, punch in a, you can punch in a product that you're applying, and it'll pop up areas where there's endangered species where you cannot apply during certain times of the year. 2,4-D, dicamba, I know are on this list. I didn't look at any others, but you can see here, I don't think we're going to be affected by this at this point. That's unless they add more endangered species to the endangered species list. So I'm just throwing that on the radar. I don't want to scare us all. I don't want us to get in a tizzy about this, but we're starting to see that impact labels. So I just want you to be aware of what that is and where it's coming from. So that's it. That's the bottom line. And I think to sum up, I want to say this. You know, this is, this is my dad right here, and then that's me, and then that's my son, Isaac. And, you know, this, this way of life that we have is something I really do want to pass on to Isaac. It means a lot to me, and I'd love for him to be able to use the same products that we're using today. And it's my responsibility to be able to use those in the right way, to take the right data so that people can continue to use them. And uh, right now, as it stands, I think if we do a good job of, as producers of watching these things and making sure we don't drift on our neighbors, um, our neighbors are going to be a lot happier, and I think we'll get to pass this on to everyone that we love and care about. So that's it. Any questions, uh, feel free to see me after this. And other than that, I don't know what's next. So we're going to take a break. So enjoy your break. You're listening to live coverage of the 2023 Caprock Crop Production Conference from the Floyd County Friends Unity Center in Muncie. At this point, we'll break for lunch and be back at 1 o'clock again hearing this afternoon from Bart Fisher uh, talking about the new farm bill and also uh, Tiffany Lashment, uh, Texas A&M AgriLife Extension Law Specialist, giving us an ag law update. So... Uh, until then, we'll step away. Join us back at 1 o'clock for the conclusion of the 2023 Caprock Crop Production Conference on the Farm Station. All ag, all day.
we're running a little bit ahead of a little bit ahead of schedule we'll just blame it on chris and uh, so our caterer is not quite ready for lunch yet. Whenever the food is ready, I will open that big garage door. So in the meantime, just feel free to please visit our booth sponsors. The conference would not be possible without their support. So if you haven't made your rounds um, around the entire uh, trade show, please do that because they probably will be packing up shortly after lunch. Um, so please go and, and talk to all of those guys and thank them for supporting the 30th.